Good morning, America. This is Sergeant Dave Matthews at gmail.com with the Remember the Fallen podcast on klrnradio.net in which every Thursday night I'll be voicing for our veterans into infinity. I'm back with vengeance after the survival instincts of an eight-ton rollover accident in the Parwan province of Afghanistan in 2004 where I lost my 90-year-old gunner, Brandon Jane Wadman, who was sitting right next to me. Please Google his name to read the whole story. I emerged from a pile of wounded soldiers on Old Kabul Road and returned to the States with even a more enduring tale of perseverance as I navigate through the riddled and troubled rapids of the VA system. I gain a new perspective that I will share with you with the fever of enthusiasm to all patriots across the windswept fields of America. You see, one of us can be ran off, two of us can be disregarded, but a podcast audience, we are a movement. All right, here we are live at the Remember the Fallen YouTube studio outside on the Sergeant Dave Matthews couch, therapy couch in beautiful Seminole County, Florida, USA on the Winter Springs Oviedo line. We're outside because we're honoring of the virus, right? The coronavirus and not being kind of close in an office. So we're listening to what the governor has been telling us all, all along. So right here, I have a great new guest here. This is Mike Phillips. Mike Phillips is uh, from the 180, and him and his wife created this band called 180. And Mike, you say you play for a veteran crowd, right? I do. You do? Okay, Mike. I know, Mike, how we both met was just a divine intervention. Um, you were just sitting right next to me, and I needed someone to do an intro to my show, and that was wonderful what you just did for us. And uh, and we met because we had like gotten a little trouble with the law, right, Mike? So yeah, um, a little yeah, bit of trouble. Yeah, real quick, how I was sitting next to you, I got a DUI, right? And Mike, you have a little bit of a history how you got here. But first, let's talk about how you came up with the band name 180. Well, Dave, it's like this. You know, I was using the metaphor of like a car. I was traveling down the street but I was going on a one-way street the wrong direction. So I had to do a U-turn. And that's an idea of my life. My life, I was going down a, a track that was just horrible. I would have either died, ended up in prison, or just you name it. And uh, I made a 180-degree turn and went the opposite direction. Well, congratulations that knowing that you, you're going now in the right direction. And that's the whole thing about Diversionary Veterans Court. What we're going through, we realize of our challenges, and we are turning around. And we do a similar mantra was with uh, Wounded Times Org, and they use uh, Clear the Road, Get Your Life Back. And that's basically what we're doing. We're getting our lives back. Um, my drug of choice was alcohol. Mike, what was your drug of choice? My drug of choice was cocaine, uh, specifically crack cocaine. Um, and I, it's been a long road that has affected my life adversely for a long time. 36 years. Oh, my God. So, Mike, what what caused that, um, this path of, of destruction uh, 36 years ago? You were pretty young. So, what what caused that? Well, I remember being, you know, coming up, I had a mother, father, a couple of brothers and a sister, and uh, we had, we, we weren't poor, we weren't rich, but, um, you know, we kind of, instead of you know, buying things for us was one of the things that my stepfather did to show us that he loved us, he cared, but there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, father and son time okay. that was quality. Okay, so your biological father wasn't there for you? My biological father, yeah, he stepped out on me. Um, I tried to meet him again a couple of times, give him an op- option. Um, and he just didn't want anything to do with me. Well, I, I see here that you also uh, found Christ. Was that most recently you found Christ? Or? Actually, it's interesting that you'd say that, Dave, um, because when I turned 15, a lot was happening in my life. Um, I had started playing guitar, and I was 15, and I found Christ uh, when I was 15, and I also had my first experience with uh, crack cocaine at 15. Oh, at 15. Whoa, at a young age. So at least you found guitar, right? It wasn't just crack cocaine. <laughs> well, I would say at least I found Christ. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, guitar has is, is definitely been a motivator and a very much of an encouragement in my life. So so how is, how is Diversionary Veterans Court changing your path now? How is that assisting you? To be honest with you, um, I had been, I'd been in jail. Jail didn't work. Uh, probation didn't work. Um, but... There's a lot of, actually, strange as it may be, 
There's a lot of care and love in Veterans Court, um, but it's directionalized me. It's given me second and third chances. Um, one of the things that's helped me most of all, uh, besides just the general care and the camaraderie with other people who are in that system and seeing growth in other people's lives, you know, gave me the idea that I can do this too. And even though it's been 36 years, I um, one of the things that helped me is uh, my Veterans Court judge. He um, gave me opportunity, by five or six opportunities, and I was testing positive for cocaine. And I was doing everything I could to hide, to not use when it was time I was going to give a test or something. And I showed up about six times. He gave me a, a general warning. He gave me community service and three days in jail. And then I started getting the point. Yeah. Three right. days in jail. And I'm like, wait a second. So those three days, I really thought about it. Then he gave me another five days. And I said, okay. And I thought to myself, do I really love to party uh, more than I love my freedom? And the answer was hell no. Right. And you said uh, in class once, you, you, you're counting the, the cracks in the ceiling, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Lay, laying, on a, laying on a jail bed, uh, counting. And, uh, there's 5,331 cracks in cell block C. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. So uh, what advice would you give, Speak Loud? What advice would you give to veterans out there that listen to the audience that might have went on the same type of path as you? What kind of advice can you give? There's hope. There's hope. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a real light, and there's real happiness. There's real peace. There's real relationships. I had thrown some stuff away, and I'm picking it back up. I got my boots on the ground, respectfully speaking. My rifle's oiled. It's ready. I've got everything. My compass is on. I'm not where I'm going, but I'm not where I've been. All right. Well, that's good. That's a good uh, plug there. So you were uh, Navy. So tell me a little bit about your little history with your military. Yeah, I, um, I joined the Navy. I was partying here in Florida and decided I wanted to change and I wanted some structure. So I joined the Navy, went to San Diego, uh, got trained up to be a corpsman, hospital corpsman, was excited about it, and then got um, in an accident, got thrown out of a moving vehicle. And um, I, after you know, I healed, they brought me in and said, listen, um, I was paralyzed, you know, the injuries, I had paralyzation in my legs, of course that, that went away, and my left arm, uh, the elbow was out of joint, I still remember it like it was yesterday, them popping that back in, and they met with me after I recovered, and they said, listen, we, we don't think that, um, we're not sure that your, your elbow can hold up under combat conditions, right. and uh, so we're going to give you an option, you can take a desk job, and of course I'm like 23, I'm like, what? desk job you know I wanted to I wanted to get in the heat and um, or you can go home with an honorable discharge and I thought about it and it didn't take me too long uh, and I went home well did you have a support system to talk about that before you made that rash decision because I know I had something similar okay where I got I actually went to OCS all right? I got chosen out of 300 soldiers and I went through OCS and I, I got through the most difficult portion of OCS is that two-week training um, it's all physical, uh, but you know I hurt my ankle back in the day. I fell off a roof and I hid it from the military, and uh, they caught me at the uh, last three days because you had to run everywhere and I was limping. And they said, Matthews, go see the medic. Uh, something wrong with your leg. Go see the medic. And the same thing happened to me. He said to me, you know, you've done nine years, and what I'm seeing with your ankle, I don't know how you're in the service. Uh, you have an opportunity to get out right now, and so I didn't have a support system that I could someone I could talk to and felt that gave me the right advice um, because I, I should have stayed in that time too. But And I did the same thing you did. I got took the honorable discharge and, and I got out and I, I got to work with my landscape business and I got it back to par because when I went away for that two weeks, the guy who was in charge of the business, he took the money, he didn't cut any grass, so I came back to a nightmare. So that was another reason why I stepped out is because of uh, my business commitments I already previously had. But, but I understand that you didn't have a support system to help you make that decision because it's so important at a young, our young age that these things happen and we need that guidance. So maybe that's something similar we have. We didn't have that guidance. So we're hoping that a lot of veterans out there, you have that guidance before you make that big decision that could ultimately change the path of your life. Uh, I'm not saying that your life's, you know, where you need to be right now. It sounds like once you get this behind you, 
uh, with the band going, and you, you have a very successful screening business. So you're on track, Mike. I just hope that you can stay focused on, on and just keep on going to the classes of the VA yeah. like I'm doing. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm disciplined with it, too, as well. And uh, before you know it, I'll be uh, out of the system and by August 21st. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Is there a certain date for you that you're looking at? Uh, I think it, I think right now I just finished the hardcore, real, real uh, intense part of the IOP. And so um, I'm going, this could be the last leg of the journey. Um, of course, I'm not in the driver's seat. I'm in the passenger seat on this. But it's 10 more weeks. It's aftercare, uh, recovery aftercare planning. So, and essentially what I'm learning is it's not enough to learn how to stay clean, how to stay and doing the right thing. How to maintain it is very important. Those triggers, right? I mean, we got to watch those. We got to see those warning signs. We have to be scanning out the horizon at all times, especially when you're out of, out of your comfort zone. Like you said, even like going to the simple store can trigger. Tell me about some of your triggers that can help someone in the audience that have some similar triggers as well. Well, I can... Um, you know, doing a screen business, I do some traveling. I try to stay in Central Florida and local, uh, but when I'm going through an area that I used to purchase drugs, or if it's an area that uh, it re- reminds me of it, I go through. It's gotten where it's kind of quick, where I go through this thought process. Oh yeah, I used to buy crack right there. Oh, okay, well I can keep going. All right, I'm okay, and then occasionally it'll be like okay well what would that be like if i went back and did some more and one of the that's the trigger and one of the tools i use to say okay listen after 35 years you're pretty convinced that if you go and you use again you're not going to want to stop you may die and you definitely can't serve other veterans doing that you can't be in the service business and be successful in that so you're seeing that 180 is going to bridge you to assist other veterans and that are, that are in need of, of services. So explain to me how the next level you want to go with your band 180. Well, what we're doing, our short-term goal for this year is to tour Central Florida. You know, we're keeping it in Central Florida. And as we're doing that, we're adjusting our gear. Our set's getting better. Um, but what I'm really wanting to do is tell the story from a perspective that, that the other vets can can relate it's boots on the ground um, and I tell it I try to tell it pretty realistically where people can understand and they can relate to it and know they're not the only one in that Thai situation could you share that with us that song addiction I would love to hear that I'd love the audience to be able to hear that yeah uh, right yes now? absolutely we'll awesome. pull, pull a little bit off here <laughs> I should be when two old buddies pulled up and said they're throwing enough on me. Well, we went to a place that I did not know to try something new that would not let me go. With everything we do, there's a price to be paid. I left the high road, yeah, stepped to the shade. One's too many, a thousand's never enough. Yeah, she smiled at me, she drove the knife in real tough. I was just 15, my life was yet unseen I strayed away from home, like a bird that had flown I was looking all around, trying to find solid ground The first time we kissed, was a feeling I not resist With everything we do, there's a price to be paid I left the high road, yeah, I stepped to the shade One's too many, a thousand's never enough, yeah She smiled at me, she drove a knife and ripped up, yeah Met her there, we had a hard love affair. A peace we didn't know, yeah, a love we couldn't share. But in my rebellion, I let the devil come in. He lied to me and left me in my sin, yeah. 
She said, I'll steal, kill, and destroy to live. I take only what you give. Can't do me, you can't refuse me. But I can't let you live. You can find me, you can die me. But you can't take me home. Because your loving mother, she's waiting by the phone. With everything we do, well, there's a past to be paid. I left the high road, yeah, stuck to the shade. One's too many. Guys, it's never enough, yeah. She smiled at me, she drove the knife in her belt. <laughs> All right, that song's Addiction, and that's from Mike Phillip from the 180. Mike, that was a great song, and that's a recovery song for you. Absolutely. And definitely, um, you're in the recovery stage, and how do you see yourself a year from now with this behind you? Um, I see myself uh, in the sun, respectively speaking, with light and hope. Um, I see myself a part of my community, part of my, my fellow veterans' lives, part of my wife's life, her a part of mine. Um, I, you know, I have a community of people um, that when I step out of the mandatory programming that the VA is helping me out with, that I'm taking over on my own and I'm filling in the blank, so to speak. What kind of advice could, right now to end the show to give to the veteran that's out in the audience who has an addiction problem? There's two things. Find people you can trust and let them in on what's going on and ask God for help. Thank you, Mike Phillips, for coming on the show. That takes a lot of courage. And I just want to thank the 180 Band as well. And, Mike, thank you for that insight. And I see and feel deep down that you're a soldier's angel. Keep up your fellowship with our veterans that are in need of our community support. And you can always email me for Mike to do a veterans tribute for the 4th of July at SergeantDaveMatthews at gmail.com. All right, now we're switching gears to an article post on woundedtimes.org. Now, all you veterans out there, if you want to have purpose, you can get involved by just going to this website, woundedtimes.org. Kathy's doing an incredible job. And you can always email me at sergeantdavematthews at gmail.com, S-G-T-D-A-V-E-M-A-T-T-H-E-W-S at gmail.com. Well, this article's out of uh, Georgia. A Georgia veteran says VA efforts to fight opioid addiction has left him and others in pain. All right, so a Georgia veteran says, Department of Veterans Affairs affects the fight addiction are leaving him and others in pain. The VA has cut in half the number of patients receiving powerful opioids. But 17-year-old Navy veteran Amos Moore says, without pain medication, just standing up is a challenge. But all of this was seen coming. In 2018, a story that really got to me when the VA was cutting opioid painkillers a couple, this is sad, they went to their, their site where they got married and the gentleman committed suicide. Yeah, this is a real tough story here. They held hands, he raised a gun to his chest and killed himself. Meredith said she and her husband went to their primary care physician and asked for a referral to another pain clinic. They were told it would take a minimum of six weeks. That was too much pain for Lawrence. In March, on the day of his next medical appointment, when his painkiller dosage was to be reduced again, he instead went to a nearby park with his wife, and on the very spot where they renewed their wedding vows, just two years earlier, they held hands, he raised a gun to his chest, and killed himself. you got to be kidding me. This is the type of stories out there that is just heartbreaking to hear. Now, as doctors taper or end opioid prescriptions, many patients are driven to despair and suicide. I have not had to take in pain medicine for a long time since the shots into my spine work, but I remember what life was like and that kind of pain and no hope of it going away. The only thing that allowed me to keep going to work was the medication to take some of the pain away. So these are some of the stories you're hearing out there, and we're going to be uh, addressing more of these. And yet another veteran was being cut back to. VA guidelines at the time were not suicide threats seriously because the pain meds were being cut back. Threat of suicide not being taken serious by the VA. Pulling up the article right now. So the VA is behind the curve on suicides. We are aware of that. So as I pull up the article on woundedtimes.org, Marine Veterans sues VA Medical Center 
Congressman Phil Rowe over opioid tapering policy. According to Rose, one of the specific VA guidelines he finds to be disturbing was that doctors should not take the threat of suicide seriously when a veteran is placed on a forced taper or denied pain medications. A Washington County man who said he endures constant pain from training injuries he suffered while serving as a Marine filed a lawsuit earlier this month over a forced opioid tapering policy that eliminates or severely reduces veterans' access to the pain medication. Robert D. Rose Jr. of Gray was a Marine sergeant when he left the service because of documented injuries he suffered during jump training. Rose made a public protest statement in July. When he turned his back on U.S. Representative Phil Rowe, our first at a plaque presentation commemorating historic buildings at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Mountain Home, Rose has taken his protest a step further with the federal lawsuit against Rowe and 17 VA medical centers and employees, including the director, doctors, nurses, and police officers. After Rose's speech in July, Rose told his story to press reporter Brandon A. Packerman. Okay, as I pull up the story, this is a pretty powerful story from a Marine taken on the VA and police officers. I, that's pretty amazing to me that he's uh, actually gone that far uh, in suing up the police. So here's the article I'm pulling up. Just takes him a little bit of time, right? So he turns his back on, on to get, you know, obviously to get attention. So this is what he did. He turned his back, took the podium to speak at a plaque presentation Monday commemorating historic buildings at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center at Mountain Home. He faced a largely supportive audience when he spoke about his passion for helping veterans. He talked about how he has dedicated much of his political energy as chairman of the House Committee of Veterans Affairs to helping veterans receive the care they need. What makes me proud of serving in Washington, now as the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee, is that the United States of America provides more for its veterans than all other nations in the world put together, Rose said. With his support for initiatives like the VA Accountability and Whistleblower Protection Act and Veteran Act, Roe, a veteran himself, has enjoyed a lot of support from many other local veterans. But not all veterans are happy with some of the policies supported by Roe. And when the congressman went to the podium Monday, Sergeant Robert Rose, a disabled veteran, turned his wheelchair to face away from the congressman when he gave his speech, showing clear contempt and an apparent gesture of protest against Roe. Rose said one of the main reasons he has relentlessly campaigned against Roe is the Opioid Safety Initiative, which he believes has denied patients, including veterans such as him, pain medications they need for their injuries. During his protest on Monday, Rose was in visible pain. I joined the Marines in 1983 as a Marine. I served in Rota, Spain, Naples, Italy, Camp Lejeune, as well as doing two deployments to the Mediterranean. I know that God protected me and that I did not see combat. But as each of you know, training can sometimes be just as dangerous, Rose said. While jumping with my Alice pack and my M16, I damaged my hip, legs, ankles, and through stupidity, damaged my spine in my short 11 years and thus became a veteran. He said many veterans like him have been denied adequate access to the health care they need since the initiative first began in 2012 and added an additional guidelines in March 2016. According to Rose, one of the specific VA guidelines he finds to be disturbing states doctors should not take the threat of suicide seriously when a veteran is placed on a forced taper or denied pain medications. Forced taper refers to a reduction in pain medications. In 2008, the Senate heard testimonies from pain doctors and specialists to determine the consequences of restricting pain medications for patients suffering from chronic pain. Dr. Alex DeLuca, a practitioner and patient's rights activist who spoke at the hearing, said, Denial of pain medications to patients is the same as a death sentence for those suffering from chronic pain. DeLuca reported that veterans and other patients affected by the initiative are twice as likely to commit suicide when denied their medications. In 2012, Congress held another hearing in which experts like DeLuca expressed the same concerns. To the dismay of veterans like Rose, the initiative went through despite these concerns. Ink still wet on these findings. In 2012, the VA began its opioid safety initiative in various cities in Minnesota and then other states. Rose said of events following DeLuca's testimony. Rose, like many other veterans 
who have become dis- disillusioned after service, believes policies such as the opioid initiative are part of a historical pattern of the government falling short when it comes to helping veterans. Currently, there are more than 23 million veterans in the United States who I proudly call my brothers and sisters in green. Many of us have witnessed firsthand or heard the many ways in which the VA delays or denies us benefits and quality health care, Rose said. The sad truth of the matter is that Congress is complicit in many of these policies. Just look at how many years it took for veterans from Vietnam to get limited benefits relating to Agent Orange. Though Rose turned his back to Roe Monday, he said he will not turn his back on what he sees as neglect and cruelty and will continue to campaign against this opioid initiative. Well, God bless you, Rose. You've stood up. That's courage as well. And this is an important matter. In addition to suicide, this is something interesting the CDC is doing to track suicides better. Researchers at the CDC and Georgia Tech are are using a whole lot of data, including social media, to forecast the suicide rate, a statistic that can lag by up to two years. Combining health data with information gleaned from Twitter and Reddit can make for better predictions. Without estimates of the real-time suicide rate, it can be incredibly difficult for public health officials to precisely direct suicide and self-harm prevention efforts where they're needed. A CDC spokesman said that those numbers can be delayed by one or two years which makes it harder to properly respond to the increasing suicide rate, which we now has surged 40% in the last two decades. That's why my one of my first articles is called, uh, my first podcast is called The Conundrum of Kill 22. It's really hard to really say there's 22 a day that commit suicide. We believe there's a lot higher out there, okay? So you want to go back to my archive show and you want to go all the way back to page 14 and it will show you the conundrum uh, 22, kill 22. I need you to look that up if you have more interest and you can see where, how it's gone in the last, uh, you know, basically 18 months. That's how long ago that show was. It's getting zero dark 30 for the show. And before I relax, never and go into rack ops mode. Go to Sergeant Dave Matthews at gmail.com. That's S G T D A V E M A T T H E W S at gmail.com for suggestions for the next podcast content. And you can always comment me on the Twitter handle at Heroic Memorials. And you can like my Facebook page. All one word now. Remember the fallen. All one word. Remember the fallen. Till all our troops come back safe from Afghanistan, I will see you next week on klrnradio.net. Remember the Fallen Show? Remember, it's in alphabetical order. I'm under R, so it's the 17th show to the right. Share it with your patriotic friends. This former ground pounder would appreciate that. All right. Fallout. Pop. Smoke. Out.